Oh, for a thousand voices, one day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. We say together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. My brothers and sisters, as we prepare to celebrate the presence of Christ in word and sacrament, let us call to mind and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in unity of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious Father, by the obedience of Jesus, you brought salvation to our wayward world. Draw us into harmony with your will, that we may find all things restored in him, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came out, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowds pressing in on you? How can you say... Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. 
Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Well, every morning, all humans do the same thing. We get up, we wash, we brush our teeth, and then we decide what we're going to wear. Generally, in our culture today, it remains true what Shakespeare wrote in Hamlet, that clothes maketh the man or woman for that matter. Do you ever wonder though why people make a career out of looking pretty? Do appearances really matter? Coco Chanel said, I don't do fashion, I am fashion. Yves Saint Laurent said, over the years I have learnt that what is important in a dress is the woman who is wearing it. Well, every week, the tabloids and our tablets are filled with paparazzi photos. Celebrities either looking their best or revealing their worst. But whatever shape they're in, what those celebrities are sporting influences the fashion choices of thousands. Designers count on it. In fact, they literally bank on it. If someone fabulous and famous wears something it will sell. The knock em dead designs on red carpet premieres are immediately copied into much cheaper knockoffs so that those with a little bit of disposable income can outfit themselves just like royalty. And even countries without royal families have their royalty. A new generation of YouTubers and influencers now count their followers literally in the millions. And I get excited when we have about 500 following us here online in church. These YouTubers literally had millions of people seeing what they're wearing. There was once a time when people would put on their Sunday best to come to church. Some still do. I'm not going to point people out. But come along to any christening service here and you'll see exactly what I mean. Whether we realise it or not, from teenager to ladder-climbing corporate bureaucrat, we think our clothes give us power and prestige. If you're a city banker, a £25 shirt from Next won't do. You'll need at least a tailored shirt from Henry Herbert's, which start at £185. And try asking a youth in a hoodie how much that hoodie has actually cost him. Or more to the point, how much their trainers are that they're wearing. And I guarantee you will be shocked. The opposite was the case for Jesus. In Galilee in the first century, Jesus' clothing was not what set him apart. What distinguished Jesus was so essential to his being that it actually permeated his clothing. The hemorrhaging woman believed in Jesus' divine power so much that she was convinced that all she had to do was to touch his clothing in order to be healed. Now, at first glance, this morning's gospel reading contains two healing miracles. The woman who has been bleeding for 12 years and the resurrected 12-year-old girl. 
But there was actually a third one, and we'll come to that soon. <coughs> there are a number of elements that link these two healing miracles. There is the obvious common elements, such as the number 12. Numbers are hugely significant in Scripture, as it's often being pointed out to me. Jairus, the, the leader of the synagogue, a, a very important man, tells Christ that his 12-year-old daughter is gravely ill. He begs Jesus to heal his, this girl. As Jesus willingly heads towards the leader's house, his clothing is touched by an unnamed woman who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years. It's not a very subtle way that the writer of St. Mark Gospel seems to be emphasising this number 12. Probably as a reference to the 12 tribes of Israel. It's probably another reference that I've missed somewhere. I'm sure I'll be told later. In a number of ways, Mark seems to be calling us to read and to interpret this encounter through the Jewish eyes of his day. However, in Jewish eyes, the woman and the girl are linked most importantly by their lowly station in life. A bleeding woman and a dead body were both ritually unclean. In their society, they were both untouchables. In their society, a, a young girl and a woman who was unable to bear children would have been seen as of little importance, not really worth worrying about. But obviously this is not how Jesus sees it. In contrast to these two very insignificant women, there is Jairus, the great leader of the synagogue. In other translations, he's referred to as the ruler of the synagogue. In a Jewish context, Jairus is about as important as it possibly could get. He would have been wealthy and powerful. And most significantly of all, Jairus would have been the man that others would have come to for help. But despite his great authority and status, Jairus throws himself at Jesus' feet, begging for a miracle. In this extraordinary outpouring of faith, Jairus becomes the focus of the third and arguably the most significant healing miracle in this encounter. He is a powerful man, but he's now utterly destroyed. He's crippled with anxiety and loss. He's absolutely desperate. In the midst of his brokenness, Jesus grants Jairus this wonderful, extraordinary request. And Jairus is healed. He is raised out of the pit of despair. Despite the fact that Jairus and the bleeding woman represent opposite ends of the social and religious spectrum, they have something very important in common. They have both turned to Jesus in absolute desperation. They both turn to Jesus when everything else has failed them. Jesus is absolutely their last resort. The gospel this morning doesn't offer details about what part of Jesus' clothing the woman touched. It might have been the, the swinging and swaying tassels affixed to the traditional garment worn by observant Jews. Or it might have been the, the edge of that seamless robe that was Jesus' sole final possession. The robe that became a prized enough possession to encourage the Roman soldiers overseeing Jesus' crucifixion to cast lots for the chance of winning it. Whatever it was, this sick-to-death outcast woman touched. She was transformed. She felt it immediately. Jesus felt it immediately too. The woman felt healed in her body. Jesus felt the healing power go out from his body. Despite the urgent, life-saving mission that Jesus was on for the sake of Jairus' daughter, he stops and demands to know who had touched him, who had been healed. When the woman with the hemorrhage came to Jesus, she was clothed in shame and rejection and hopelessness. When Jairus came to Jesus, he was clothed in grief and desperation. 
When Jesus touched both of them, their lives were transformed and their clothing was changed. A woman's life as an outcast was restored as the life of a normal woman. Her clothing was changed. A father's life as a mourner became the restored life of a joyful parent. His clothing was changed. Are you ready for clothes changed this morning? Our society doesn't really encourage us to admit that we're desperate or needy. Most of us try to convince others that we're always in control. There are even many Christians who have a rather painful-looking smile permanently plastered on their face, desperately trying to convince the world that Christianity makes them immune from all the struggles and disappointments of life. Today's Gospel reading seems to encourage something quite different. Jairus and the unnamed woman are only healed when they admit their absolute dependence on Jesus Christ. The fact that they've tried everything else before they turn to Jesus only seems to make their desperate pleas all the more welcome. If you're only here today or watching online because you're absolutely desperate, if you're here today or watching online because you've known great loss and anxiety, if you're only here or watching today because this is your last resort, well, you're in the right place. In fact, it doesn't even matter what you're wearing. You could be watching online in your pyjamas for that Jesus cares. Jesus was just hoping that you would come. Amen. Let us now stand and affirm our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate with the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So we sit all kneel as we now offer up to God our prayers of intercession. Everlasting God, as we are gathered together in love and fellowship, hear us now as we bring before you our cares and our needs. We pray for your church throughout the world, for Christians everywhere meeting in small house groups, in rural and town churches, and in great city cathedrals. Grant that we and all your people may be built up in our faith, 
and show in our lives the love that we see in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we pray for Christians working in places of power and influence who make decisions which affect the lives of so many people. We ask you to bless those who work in politics, in the media, in advertising and in the financial markets. May they all know what to say and how to act for the benefit of all people and at all times to be true and faithful to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray for those whom we love, families and friends, who are special people in our lives, wherever they may be. We pray for their hopes, their fears, their problems, their needs. But most of all, we thank you for each one of them and for what they give and mean to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, today's gospel showed the tremendous faith of a sick woman. Help us to learn from this that we should always pray and not give up. And that if we ask, it will be given. We raise before you now all of those who we know who need to touch the hem of Jesus' garments and receive health and healing in their lives especially for those anyway effect, affected by the coronavirus. For those who have asked to be named in our prayers, we pray for Ashley Banks, Heather Domit, Matthew Stiles and Nigel Boston. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Merciful God, into your caring hands, we commit those who have died and we pray for all who are mourning the loss of any loved one. This warm morning we pray and remember James Taylor, Dorothy Baines, Philip Thompson, Maureen Boyd, Gordon Hislop, Terry Stobart, Joan Barton, Frank Farmer Jr. and Peter Crump. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we have laid before you our concerns and we now offer you our thanks and praise for all the blessings and gifts that lavish on us. In the weeks ahead, help us to keep the faith as deeply and as passionately as Jairus and the woman at the lake. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you all please stand? There is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and by the one Spirit we're all baptised into the one body. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And let us offer one another a sign of that peace.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth, for by the breath of your mouth you have spoken your word, and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. And though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy and peace. As we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth, we echo the song of the angels in heaven, evermore praising you and singing. God, you are the most holy one, enthroned in splendour and light. Yet in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, you reveal the power of your love, made perfect in our human weakness. Embracing our humanity, Jesus showed us the way of salvation. Loving us to the end, he gave himself to death for us. Dying for his own, he set us free from the bonds of sin, that we might rise and reign with him in glory. On the night that he gave up himself for us all, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take Eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the death that he suffered on the cross. We celebrate his resurrection, his bursting from the tomb. We rejoice that he reigns at your right hand on high and we long for his coming in glory. As we recall the one perfect sacrifice of our redemption. Father, by your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of your creation be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Form us into the likeness of Christ and make us a perfect offering in your sight. Look with favour on your people, and in your mercy hear the cry of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sick, let the oppressed go free, and fill your church with power from on high. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with St Mary and St Helena and all your saints at the table in your kingdom, where the new creation is brought to perfection, in Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in the one bread.
Draw near with faith and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave you in his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for us all, may keep us in eternal life. Amen. Lord of Christ, shed for us all, may keep us in eternal life. Amen.
Eternal God, comfort of the afflicted and healer of the broken. You have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, the notices have all been emailed out today. If you're not on the email list and you would like to be on the email list, uh, please do drop me a line or message us online and we'll add you to the weekly notice sheet. Uh, but there are some printouts, hopefully still available, at the back of church uh, for those who prefer to have a printed copy. Um, I think it's on there. Uh, what we're going to do now, we have to do something which we haven't done yet because um, I've been waiting to get two church wardens in the church at the same time. <laughs> Uh, we've got to swear them in. Uh, normally, um, post-COVID, etc., all church wardens of the archdeaconry would gather in a church for uh, a great service with the archdeacon, and all the church wardens of the archdeaconry would stand up and swear at the archdeacon, say uh, swear an oath of allegiance at the archdeacon. The clergy just swear at the archdeacon. Um, and they would then be duly admitted into their posts, etc. Uh, during the COVID rules, they, that's all been uh, delegated down to parish level. Uh, so they get to swear at me. Sorry, they get to swear an oath of allegiance uh, in front of me, and I get to admit them into it. Um, so would um, Leslie and Chris like to come forward to the step, please? And you can stand two metres apart in a socially distant sort of way. Because <laughs> we have to do this. So at the APCM, uh, you two were both uh, voted into office uh, for the next year. And so I now ask you to make the oath of allegiance. On behalf of the Bishop of St. Albans, I do therefore admit you to the office of Church Warden in the parish of St. Mary and St. Helena, Elstow, for the current year in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you two like to turn and face uh, the congregation? And I think they, all, they both deserve a huge round of applause because they are now duly elected as our Church Warden. It's online as well, you know, they can freeze frame it and... <laughs> oh, sure, Sunday times, so that's all right. Well, I happen to know the Archdeacon watches us occasionally, you see, tunes in to make sure we're doing these things properly. So, okay, boss. <laughs> so may God keep you in all your days. May Christ shield you in all your ways. May the Spirit bring you healing and peace. May the God, the Holy Trinity, drive all darkness from you and, and pour upon you blessings and light. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of God.